Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. I think we are ready to start. Excellency, good morning. Welcome. I hope you had a, a good night of sleep. You were able to rest. You were not jet lag. Uh, we're very happy to have here with us uh, Professor Ingrid Woolard. She teaches at the University of um, Cape Town in the School of Economics. She has uh, multiple hats. A lot of her time she spends managing the first panel household survey. Actually, she's uh, one of the creators of this, uh, of this panel, the first of its kind in South Africa. She also has a job that I guess is quite stressful because uh, many workers in the formal sector at the end of the day are affected by her, some of her decisions. She's the chair of the commission in charge of setting the minimum wage in South Africa. Actually, this is a very good example of how countries should manage uh, minimum wage policy. It's something we have to learn. And today, she's going to be talking about um, a topic that is very relevant for this conference, what are the options that countries have to manage youth unemployment, to address the problem of youth unemployment that, as you know, is a major issue in, uh, in her country, South Africa. So without further ado, Professor, the floor is yours. Let me see if I can figure out how to balance my notes and everything else. Um, that could be interesting. Good morning, everybody. Um, thank you so much for being here, and thanks very much to the organizing committee for inviting me to this wonderful conference in this fantastic city of, of, of Delhi. Um, I want to just acknowledge funding that um, we at Zelda have received from the IDRC for um, a project called Social Protection and Labor Market Outcomes of Youth in, in South Africa. So <coughs> just to give you a brief outline of what I'm going to be talking about today, I'm going to touch um, extremely briefly on the international international context. Um, we heard a lot about that in the opening session yesterday, so I don't want to spend too much time on that. From there, I'm going to move on to talking a bit about the extent of the youth unemployment problem um, in South Africa, and whether youth unemployment really is a, is a different problem to, to that of aggregate unemployment. Does it, is there, is there really, are there really grounds for treating this as a, as a separate problem, rather than just using general unemployment um, uh, um, policies, and those, of course, would, in, in, um, would impact on the youth as well. And then I'm going to spend the second half of the presentation talking about some of the policy responses in South Africa. What are some of the things that are being tried? Um, do we know whether they're working? What are some of the things that we, they, um, that we perhaps should be trying and have not yet experimented with? <coughs> so again, just to, to very briefly put, put this in the international context. Uh, does this work that far? I don't think so. Okay, never mind. Oh, there's one here. So if we look at what's been happening to, to youth unemployment um, throughout the world, we can see that there were some gains made in, in, in reducing youth unemployment post-2002, um, right up until about 2007, and then with the crisis, that's kicked up significantly again. So youth unemployment, ever since 2009, sitting at about 12.6, 12.7, even 12.8 percent this year. So really, um, even though the crisis has already peaked and, and, and we're, we're to some extent in recovery, youth unemployment hasn't been coming right. <coughs> I'm actually going to dispense with the notes and hope for the best. Um, so what this slide is trying to show is, is, I know it's quite hard to read these numbers, it, it's looking at the ratio between the adult, sorry, between the youth unemployment rate and the adult unemployment rate. So what, what sort of ratio does one, does one typically see? So what we have over here is a ratio of one to one. So what we immediately note is that there are no countries in the world where the youth unemployment rate is lower than the adult unemployment rate. Not entirely surprising. <coughs> also remarkably few countries though where the unemployment, where the adult, where the youth to adult unemployment rate is between one and two. Very few countries in that part of the graph. And then vast numbers of countries where, the, um, where that ratio lies between two and three, but also quite a few countries where the ratio is in fact greater than three to one. So 
It's true everywhere that youth unemployment rates tend to be higher than adult unemployment rates. In South Africa, we often think of ourselves as being in this um, rather unique situation where the, the, uh, the youth to adult unemployment rate is about two and a half times, is about 2.5. Um, that in itself is not unusual. What's perhaps important about South Africa, though, is that the, the adult unemployment rate is so high that once you, double, once you multiply that by 2.5, you really are looking at a, at a massive youth unemployment rate um, of about 50%. <coughs> um, just, again, thinking a little bit, a little bit about um, uh, the demographic picture throughout the world. So it's, um, it's the case that we're now... Um, sorry, I find it terribly disconcerting when you keep taking photos. Um, so the... the the, the youth population in Africa is growing quite rapidly. So um, while the, the youth population um, across the entire world uh, will peak in about, in about 2035, uh, even, even at that point, the African youth population will continue to grow. So we're in a situation where, um, where this obviously needs to be managed in some way. Uh, the youth bulge presents both an opportunity, presents an opportunity from the point of view that um, Sorry, because for the, yeah, sorry. Um, the, this, youth, this, this youth bulge presents an opportunity from the point of view that obviously that means we're, we're heading, heading towards a, a larger working age population. If one can, if one can, uh, if one can harness that youth, uh, that, that youth productivity, um, then, then one can really see a demographic dividend. On the other hand, if it's poorly managed and, and youth become disaffected and, um, and aggrieved, then quite easily you can end up in a situation of, of political instability and, um, and social discontent. So it really, it, this really is, is the time at which we need to think hard about how Africa manages um, that demographic process. Obviously, alongside this, this, this changing, change in, in the demographic picture, all countries have, an, have a growing elderly population. So we need to also think hard about how we, how we manage, manage that alongside. <coughs> South Africa is a slightly different, has a slightly different age profile. Um, there are a couple of, of first of all, we, we're about midway through the demographic transition. Um, so the youth, the youth population has been um, at about 20% for, um, for the last couple of decades. That population is now starting to decline as a share of the total population. What we then also have, of course, is a massive HIV-AIDS pandemic. So about um, one in 10 adults today is, is living with HIV-AIDS in South Africa. So we have what one might think of as a kind of a missing middle. So we have had this youth population that, that's, that's been growing, um, and now an elderly population, which is growing very, very rapidly. So an el uh, we go, we're heading towards a, a, a much bigger um, older person population than, than we've ever had before, but without necessarily that, that middle group of working age individuals able to support it that easily. So from that point of view, South Africa is in a, in a slightly different situation. <coughs> okay, let me just give you some very sort of broad brush facts, facts about the South African labor market. The official unemployment rate is 25%, um, very high by world standards. If one were to use a broader definition, which included um, discouraged work seekers, people that want to work but um, have perhaps stopped looking for work, uh, then that number goes up to 33%. Perhaps more important than that is the fact that only 41% of working age people are actually working. Um, and if, so if we think about that in, in, in the international context of, of perhaps comparing ourselves, um, just for argument's sake, to the, to, to the BRICS, if you were to look at this, um, you would see that Brazil's labor absorption ratio, in other words, the percentage of, of people that are working, um, is about 65%, that for India is about 55%, and for China more than 70%. So South Africa's uh, labor absorption ratio of, of only 41% is really incredibly low compared to just about anybody. Um, and that's, that's clearly a source of concern. <coughs> so earlier we, I spoke about the fact that the, the youth to adult unemployment ratio is about 25 If you look at this in terms of what's the youth to adult employment ratio, it's even more dismal than that. Um, so if, here we have South Africa. The red blocks are the youth, you, uh, are the percentage of youth that are working. South Africa, that number is about 15%. Um, it's the lowest of any country with recorded statistics in the world. Um, and obviously, the, the gap between the youth employment rate, uh, rate and the adult employment rate um, is, is, is massive. So what we 
what we do see is that ultimately many of these people do move into work. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not the situation that, you know, once you're unemployed, you must be unemployed forever, um, which is the, the story that a lot of people, got, especially in South Africa, like to tell. That simply can't be true, because even over time, um, what we, do, we do see very rapidly declining unemployment rates um, by age. So if we, this is, this, is, uh, this is now using about 20 data sets with, um, over the last few years, and looking at what we're really trying to do here is say, well, is the problem getting significantly worse? Is it the case that unemployment rates today are massively worse in South Africa than they were um, 10 years ago, a decade ago? And it, it, it seems that that's not actually the case. Massive differences by age, um, but it's, it's, it's not the case that, oh, well, this generation will never find jobs, even though the previous generation did. Um, it, it, it seems that we have a fairly... Um, Fairly stable unemployment rates by age. <clears throat> okay. So the question then arises, should one specifically target the youth? Um, isn't it enough to just say, well, we, we, if we have unemployment policies that, that, that reduce aggregate unemployment, then by virtue of, 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 uh, of, of doing that, then the youth unemployment rate will, will also fall. But I, th I think one needs to consider the fact that youth do face specific barriers. They may be particularly vulnerable, um, given that, in particular, in a, in a tight labor market, they're, they're, they're completely untested. So if, in a, in a situation of, with excess labor supply, if an employer is able to choose between a, a worker with some experience that's been tested in the market, comes with some kind of, of references, and, um, and, 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 and is better able to signal it seems likely that the employer is going to go for the low-risk um, low risk worker with, um, um, <clears throat> rather than a young person that, that's untested, and particularly in the case where it's very hard to get, to get rid of workers, as it is in South Africa, which we'll talk about a bit later. One also needs to think about the sort of the longer run. So if we're investing in young people today, then, um, well, if we're, if we're specifically targeting young people today, then it might be the case that we, we can, we're looking forward to a, you know, another 30, 40 years of, 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 of uh, labor market career for these young people. So it, it, one can also think about it in that perspective. So youth are different in, 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 in some ways. Um, in, they're more educated, but of course they're also less experienced, and, they, and they, they're not as able to signal. One also needs to think about wage scarring. We, we know from, from international literature that if people don't get into the labor market early, um, that then has very long-run impacts in terms of, 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 the, of the wages that they earn later on and of their employment probabilities throughout their lives. There's also plenty of evidence which suggests that um, in terms of mental and physical health, youth unemployment has, has significant impacts on depression, anxiety, psychosomatic symptoms, um, and, and obviously the, the, those also have, have, have cost to the economy and ramifications for, for, for later labor market policy. And then as I touched on earlier, um, there's, there's, always, there's, a, there's always a high risk that if you have highly educated young people with expectations um, and, uh, uh, and when they then don't find work, they can quite quickly become disaffected and all that, that youthful energy can get channeled in, um, in, 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 less, in less desirable ways. Okay, so I want to hold on for me one sec. So I want to talk a little bit about youth employment policies in South Africa. Um, I'm going to talk to some extent about what is happening, to some extent about what we, what we know from the international literature, and then I'm also going to touch on some things that we, that we haven't, in my view, thought hard enough about in South Africa or been sufficiently willing to experiment with. So very importantly, I'm not going to be talking at all about macro and growth policy. Um, it's certainly, as, as we heard yesterday, the case that, that those are, are the most fundamental aspects in terms of, of, of changing, changing the environment um, in, uh, uh, and, and, and thereby reducing unemployment. That's not my area of expertise. Um, I think we, d we had brilliant presentations on, on this topic yesterday. So what I'm going to be talking about specifically are about the labor market policies and to some extent social policies that can perhaps tweak unemployment rather than... Um, move it in, in as dramatically as, as macro policy could. <clears throat> Which sounds like a bit of a cop-out, I, I, I grant you. 
So one of the things that we clearly need to do is, is given that, that we're in a, in, in a situation of, of skill, skill bias, technological change, the labor market is changing rapidly, we do need to think about the long run and about, about better education um, for the next cohort of young people. Obviously, for the young people in the labor market today, for a large, to a large extent, their education has, has already happened. Um, there's some room for training, which, which I'll talk about in a moment, but we do need to be thinking about the next generation and, and, and about employment for them. And very importantly, we need to be thinking about the, the tra that transition from school to work. This is quite a complicated slide, but I do, th I do think it has a very interesting and rather depressing tale to tell. So this is data from, from the household panel that, um, that David mentioned earlier. This is work by Nicola Branson using the first two waves. And what she does is she looks at, she breaks down the sample by, by what grade were, were, were these young people in in 2008. So school in South Africa ends at grade 12. So if we look at, at these young people that were nearing the end of, of their schooling career in 2008, she then says, well, what were they doing two years later in 2010? So for a moment, let's just focus on, on males that were in grade 12 in 2008. A couple of them are still in school, so in other words, they must have, they must have failed, um, failed either grade 11 or grade 12. They're still in school. Um, some of them have gone on to further education and training, so they've gone on to colleges or they've gone on to university. Um, these people up here are working. And then in, be in between, we have this massive group, about half the sample, that are what we've now come to call NEETs, not an, educa not an employment, education, or training. So essentially, unemployed or doing very little at all. So <clears throat> a rather depressing tale of, of, of that transition. Two years later, half of them are tra have transitioned into not doing anything particularly useful right now. Um, story for, 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 for women is, is a little bit different. Many more of them staying on um, in education many more of them staying on to finish their finish grade 12 if they haven't already done so, but then more of them moving into further education and training. But very few of them moving into work. So conditional on, on, on not going on, on to, to, to stay in education, it seems that it's harder for girls to transition into the labor market than boys. On the other hand, um, maybe the, there's a, there's a self-selection there. The, 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 the better female participants are um, are going on to further education. So it's, it's, it, I think it's, it's, it's hard to infer from that that there's some kind of discrimination going on in the labor market. But all in all, a, a story of clearly very slow transition, transitioning from, from, from school to work. <clears throat> and that needs to be a, a, a clear area of focus. <clears throat> so in terms of training programs in South Africa, um, we actually spend quite heavily on these. Uh, there's a payroll tax of 1%. Of um, on all, on all um, employees, which goes to something called the Sectoral Education and Training Authorities. There are about 23 of them, um, and they then specifically spend money on, on their own sector. So that sounds like a very positive thing. On the other hand, the difficulty here is that essentially they're only spending money on people that are already in the labor force. Um, there, there is, there's some provision made for them using that money towards the unemployed, but um, that, of course, is much harder to do. Um, it, 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 it's not nearly as, as, as straightforward as having firms within your sector demand particular kinds of training. So for the most part, the, um, this, this, this training money only goes on people that are already, in, um, already working. Um, work by, by Haron over there and, and his team suggests that um, there's very weak reporting um, that goes on. There is this absolutely no evaluation that's happened. There's, there's, there's very little management of the system. So for the most part, it's viewed as, as quite a dysfunctional system. Um, lots of money, clearly some potential, but for the, for the time being, not, um, not, not accomplishing a great deal. As I say, no real rigorous evaluation of these programs. There's been um, one study I know of which found that 57% of people um, that went into one of the programs for the unemployed did find a job subsequently, but one has absolutely no idea what the counterfactual would have been. Um, which makes it, it, it hard to, to know whether 57% is, is, is high or low. Um, something that we've spent, we really haven't thought hard about in South Africa is entrepreneurship. Um, the informal sector in South Africa is incredibly small. Of those that are in the labor force, uh, of those that are working, only one in six people is in the informal sector. So a very different picture of the labor market to anything you would see anywhere else in sub-Saharan Africa. So given that the informal sector is so small, when, and given that there are so many 
youth unemployed, one might think that that's an obvious area for stimulus. Um, people who have, have uh, Geeta Kingdon and, and John Knight have, have done interesting work trying to look at why is the informal sector in South Africa so small. And they find various barriers um, such as, as credit constraints. Um, but those should be true elsewhere. Uh, it's, it's not obvious that, that if you're a South African, it should be harder for you to get, um, to, to get going in the informal sector than, for example, if you live in India. Um, South Africans do have alternative uh, sources, of, sources of income. The household incomes are not that low. Um, it, it, it's a bit of a, it, it, it's hard to, I think, entirely, entirely buy that argument. There's also an argument that, um, that apartheid quashed any kind of creativity and entrepreneurial spirit. Um, and and if, if that's the case, then hopefully there is room for entrepreneurship pro programs. If you start them with, with young people, um, it, it, one can see that they might, they, you know, one might get a payoff, payoff there. But it's certainly something that one needs to at least be trying to do, given how small the informal sector is. Obviously, we're not necessarily saying that, we, we, that it's desirable to have all our young people in the informal sector. Um, but if there is some possibility of transitioning from informal sector ultimately to, 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 to more decent work, um, then, then, then it's, it's a more plausible uh, avenue. In terms of employment services, so obviously employment services are, um, are, are, uh, are something which can really help in, in, in increasing the efficiency of either job search or, or job matching. In South Africa, we have a myriad of, of, of schemes. Nobody seems to be able to tell when, whether any of them entirely work. Um, they're, all run, they're all run by, um, by the government. Well, for the most part, they're run by the government. And um, the government seems, it seems intent on, on promoting this even further. So, for example, there's a proposed employment services bill which would create public employment services to which all employers would be obliged to provide information about any vacancies that arose and about the filling of those vacancies, which sounds incredibly bureaucratic. Um, it's the idea that every time a vacancy arises within your firm, you need to do some paperwork, you need to submit it to the Department of Labor. They then need to communicate it to all the labor centers in the country. Uh, they presume, you presume you then have to wait some time for them to get back to you about whether they found a suitable person before you can do your own um, kind of, of recruitment. So it, 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 it sounds to me like something that really is not going to um, make things better, but could make things a whole lot worse. Um, but, but time will tell. <clears throat> in terms of, of, of direct public sector employment schemes, or what, what we in South Africa call, call public works programs, um, these are obviously popular throughout the world. About 9% of active labor market policy spending in, in OECD countries goes on, on these sorts of public sector job creation schemes. Um, very little international evidence that they have positive long-term effects on employment. So obviously, they, in the short run, they, they clearly create employment. That's what they're designed to do. The question is, does, does having worked on a public work scheme then help you get a job um, once you exit, once you graduate from the public work scheme? And, and the evidence on that is, seems that frequently you do not. Um, South African, the South Africa program is massive. Um, it's, 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 it's being made larger all the time. Very importantly, though, we see very low take-up of young people onto public work schemes. Um, without very good evidence, it's hard to know exactly why that is, but one suspects that part of the story is about the fact that the young are typically quite highly educated. And a highly educated person doesn't necessarily um, aspire to working on a public works program where you're ch cutting down trees or doing quite hard manual labor on a, on a road constru construction scheme. So perhaps we need slightly different programs um, for young people working on public works programs. There's a very exciting idea being floated at the moment that, for example, what you might want to do is take some of these young school leavers and put them into classrooms as, as teaching assistants. Um, given that they, they, have all, all, um, they have exited grade 12, they have something to offer, and we do have a, a, a schooling crisis. So that's, the, you know, when you, I think needs to be more creative about ways in which one gets, gets young people onto these programs. So Professor Barty told us yesterday that um, talking about labor regulation and labor market flexibility is a touchy subject, but that nothing should be taboo and we should, we should talk about it anyway. Um, I'm obviously on quite, quite uh, icy ground given that I, I chair the commission which sets minimum wages, um, but I'm, I'm going to talk about labor market regulation anyway. Um, 
so it, it seems, so in South Africa, the, the ratio of pay to productivity according to the World Economic Forum is extremely high, all right? By international standards, it seems that wages are very high relative to productivity. An earlier study by Lewis in 2001 found that that was particularly true for, for, for the young. So given that, do we perhaps need to think about some ways in, 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 in which we can reduce that ratio of pay to productivity? Now, obviously, there are two ways you can do that. You can increase productivity or you can reduce the wage. Um, so I'm going to talk very briefly about, about three aspects of this. I'm going to talk about how we might make the youth labor market more flexible. I'm going to talk about lowering wage expectations of young people. Um, and I'm going to talk briefly about the youth wage subsidy. There are two presentations this afternoon specific, that will, I know, talk in detail about this, the proposed wa wage subsidy, one by David Faulkner um, and the other by, by Neil Rankin. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that, but I do think it's interesting, so I'll touch upon it. <clears throat> So labor market flexibility might be particularly important for young people for all the reasons that I've already spoken about. Um, if, it, if it's the case that a, that a young person looks more risky, is untested, um, then you want to make that person look more attractive. And uh, one of the ways in which you might do that is by making, uh, making it possible to pay a young person less than, um, uh, less than somebody else. And you also want to make it, uh, reduce the risk by making it possible for that person to be fired. Um, so that, that's, that seems like something pretty obvious that we need to do if we're going to, make youth, if we're going to reduce youth unemployment. South Africa, unfortunately, appears to be moving in exactly the opposite direction. Um, these are proposed amendments to the, to the labor law, which um, probably will never get en enacted, but they're, they're still a bad signal for what, for what government is, is, is proposing to do. So, for example, they want to require that part-time and contract staff receive benefits of similar or equal value to those received by permanent staff, so it wouldn't be possible to pay a person less um, even if they were on a, on a short-term contract. And it, or, they also want to allow the minister to prohibit or regulate the use of any kind of labor broking. Um, so to, 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 essentially you're, you're saying the firm must appoint somebody directly um, and we want all work to be of the same quality as, um, as, as permanent jobs. And that certainly doesn't seem like a move in, in the right direction. Right, in terms of lowering the wage expectations of young people, so there's been quite a lot of work done in South Africa which says that, in fact, wage expectations are not unreasonable. Um, if you ask people what, uh, what is the minimum amount that you'd be prepared to work for, people typically come back with an answer which is pretty much exactly what a regression would tell you that person could expect to earn in the existing labor market. So for decades now we've been saying that we do not have a reservation wage problem. But there are two points about that. The first is that essentially what we're measuring when we measure expected wages is we're, we're measuring what goes on mm. in the existing labor market. Right? Uh, most jobs are with big firms. Big firms we know from work done by, by Neil Rankin um, that in fact wages in, in smaller firms where more of the job creation is happening tend to be a bit lower. Um, so it could well be that, that my, so my expectation is that I should earn what a big company would pay but in reality, those are not the jobs that are, that are out there. And in any event, it's, it's, it's probably always the wrong way to think about the problem. What we need is, is, to, is that your reservation wage should actually equal something a bit closer to the market clearing wage. So you need to think about what would you be willing to accept in a different labor market, a labor market in which actually many more people were employed and there was possibly some, some downward pressure on, on, on the wage. So I think we're fundamentally thinking about this in the wrong way, and I do think we have a reservation wage problem. So given that, there's, that, given that we think that um, the ratio of productivity to pay is too high, what are some of the ways in which we can, with, uh, we can, we can try and address that? So there's a, been a five-year discussion about a youth wage subsidy in South Africa. Um, it should have been implemented at the beginning of this year. It hasn't been. It's not clear that it will ever be. Um, which would be a real pity because it really does seem like it, it, it's, a, it's the first time we've had real recognition that there might be a, there might be a problem with the wage um, and that a, 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 an intervention which directly addresses that, that um, would be an interesting experiment if nothing else. So the idea of the youth wage subsidy was that all youth aged 18 to 29 would be eligible. Um, they'd get a subsidy, perhaps loaded up onto a smart card of about $800 and they'd be able to use that on a monthly basis for up to 24 months. Um, at the low end of the income, uh, of, of the wage distribution, that basically means that, that about half of, of, of the wage would be subsidized um, at, at, at the bottom end. So quite a, quite a, a significant subsidy. Um, 
And obviously it might, there's another outcome of this might be that it might incentivize formalization. So it would be, it would be administered via the tax authorities as a tax credit. Um, so the only way in which firms would be able to access it um, would be to come into the tax net and, 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 and formalize in some way. <clears throat> Um, some work that I did together with Jim Levinson and um, Abhishek Banerjee, uh, in fact, went a bit further. And so we said that we, we think this idea of a wage, wage subsidy is, is, is a great one, but actually we think you could do a little bit more. And one of the things we suggested is that you tie it to relaxed um, firing, firing rules for, for, for young people, perhaps some kind of probationary period during which there would be a no questions asked um, possibility of firing, maybe for up to 10 weeks. Um, and we also said it's, one, needs to think of, one needs maybe to also think about a two-tier minimum wage system whereby young people might earn a, a different minimum as, as actually happens in, in many countries. Um, government didn't go for those two aspects of the wage subsidy. Um, and as it is, it seems that the, the wage subsidy probably won't happen due to political pressure. So what are the concerns about the wage subsidy? There's a, there's a concern that, there's, that this is, that this is a erosion of part of the decent work agenda, um, that you would be creating a two-tier labor market with these, these, these sort of poor quality, low-paid jobs. Um, much bigger concern about displacement of older workers, that firms are gonna, um, are gonna get rid of older workers and, and bring in these young people just in order to get the subsidy. Bit of a tough um, sell, if you ask me. The subsidy is not that big. The idea of, of getting rid of established workers known to have high productivity in order to take on an untested worker for a small subsidy, um, unclear that that, would, that that would happen in reality, but we may never know. Um, real concerns about dead weight losses, possibility that actually none of this um, would go anywhere, that there would be no new emp employment um, and it would just be a very expensive um, scheme and uh, with, with, with no real outcomes. The unions are obviously also very concerned that the subsidy would be entirely captured by the firms. Um, again, we'd see no new employment, but the, 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 the firms would, would capture the entire, um, entire subsidy. And at, at the, at, underlying all of this is the, is the notion from the unions that actually there is no problem here. We do not have a productivity problem. Wages are not too high. Um, and, and given that, it, 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 it's very hard to take the conversation forward. Right, I'm gonna be very brief, but I just I wanna put two more quick ideas out there that, that have absolutely no traction in the current debate, um, but I think are, are, are worth thinking about. The one is to ease the, the immigration of, skilled, of high skilled labor into South Africa, and the other is to think about introducing unemployment benefits, um, even for people that have never worked. So in terms of easing the immigration of skilled labor, so if we believe that unskilled and high skilled labor are, complement, are complements, um, then it, it could well make, it could, then it would make sense to say, well, actually, let's relax um, immigration laws. Let's make it possible for people with high skills from the rest of Africa or perhaps from Asia to come into South Africa. Um, and, and, and therefore, by, by um, loosening the, the constraint on high skills, perhaps we'll see um, higher employment of, of, of lower skilled people and therefore raise the demand even for unskilled labor. Um, that certainly is not the view of the South African government. Um, they're, currently, their they're, they're plans are foot to, um, to increase the difficulty with which um, people can, can, can come into South Africa. Um, for example, a firm has to now uh, put a, 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 do, again, a great deal of paperwork to demonstrate that there is, it is impossible to hire a South African before they may look abroad for somebody else. And then once that person arrives, there needs to be a skill transfer program in place such that the person can make themselves redundant as quickly as possible, which is, is not in, its, in itself a, a bad idea, but all this increased bureaucracy and, re, and red tape is gonna make it harder and harder for, for high school um, migrants to come into South Africa. I'm running out of time. Um, so the last thing I wanna talk about is, do we perhaps wanna think about some kind of unemployment benefits for people that have never worked? Um, so right now, South Africa has unemployment insurance, but it's a contributory scheme. So unless you've, already, unless you've already worked and contributed to the scheme, you can't collect any sort of unemployment insurance. Um, there's some evidence, uh, Kelly Ardington this afternoon is gonna be talking about some evidence which suggests that actually even existing social grants going into South African households seems to um, increase labor supply of other household members. So it seems that by, by, by bringing some income into the household, once providing in money perhaps for job search or for childcare and making it possible for, for other household members to go out and search. So given that evidence, it might be the case that 
um, one could get an even bigger effect with, a, with genuine unemployment benefits. So by, by, by providing, for example, call it a search subsidy if you don't want to call it an unemployment benefit, but giving money directly to the person for whom it's intended, rather than this rather circuitous way of saying, we give money to granny and granny then gives, gives me some of the money such that I can go and search. Um, but again, that, that, that from a completely different, um, uh, much more conservative part of the South African population um, is not proving a, a very popular idea at all. Um, this idea that we would actually pay people who haven't, um, who, who haven't contributed to the scheme in any way. I'm out of time, so I'm going to leave it there. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ingrid. It was a very interesting presentation. A lot of challenges, no easy solutions. We still have... Um, Ten minutes before we go to coffee break, so it would be nice to have a discussion here so I can take a couple of questions from the floor. One, two, three. Let's start with those. Luis. You need one because we're streaming the session, yeah. Okay, good. Excellent. Um, Ingrid, one thing you didn't mention is the whole issue of um, employability skills. Uh, so learning to show up to work on time, uh, learning, working in teams, you know, being responsible to a supervisor, et cetera, et cetera. And um, the issue being that uh, schools in South Africa don't teach that. There's a focus on teaching to an exam, which is a, probably a reasonable measure of literacy and numeracy, et cetera. And of course, obviously, all the labor regulations you put in work against people in school uh, getting some kind of internship to learn those. Uh, but it seems to me that that um, that issue remains. And I would say that's uh, substantively different from many OECD countries where in various ways, uh, say, people over the age of 16 are able to get some kind of uh, work experience part-time during the summer, whatever. Um, they have uh, uh, facilities uh, for that kind of thing to happen, temporary work in tourist sessions during the season, um, whatever. And so I just wondered why you left that whole uh, issue of employability skills uh, out. Uh, thank you, Ingrid. I think it was a terrific presentation. A couple of questions. Uh, Closer. Uh, the first is about, you, you didn't really mention something that which is widely discussed uh, also in the G20 context, and this is uh, apprenticeship programs, dual vocational education. This idea that uh, in order to promote the transition from school to work, um, there is way in which you can learn on the, on the, on the job as well as uh, in, in classrooms. And I think, you know, at the G20 context, there's been a lot of effort to try to scale up apprenticeship programs. I know it's very difficult, but it's also a way to bring more the employers into, the, into this game and actually opening up opportunity for young people, convince that employer that there is a, a scope to actually give uh, young people a chance to sort of learn on the job. And there are ways in which you can organize that. I mean, you don't have to think about the German model, but I think this is actually widespread also in a number of emerging economies. The second point is uh, what you mentioned at the end of your presentation. This is about unemployment benefit for young people. I think it, earlier on in your presentation, you mentioned that there is um, the, the job search support, all the other things that in general go very well with unemployment benefit. If you just give us you know, unemployment benefit to young people as well as to other people, but you don't help you know, in the job search process and so on and so forth, it might be just a sort of a subsidy. I know that there is evidence in South Africa that uh, 
sort of a certain type of uh, social protection benefit, help reduce the liquidity constraint for households, actually promote labor supply and the participation of women into the labor market. I wonder whether this kind of evidence would apply also for young people. If it is not supported by some effort to actually help young people searching for jobs, providing them training that may help them sort of uh, find jobs in the market and so on. Thank you. So one question here and then over there. Mm -hmm. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ingrid. My name is Arian Han. I'm with IDRC. And, um, my, my question is around when you, when you talked about the, uh, the flexibilization of labor market, uh, uh, what the role of, uh, of what you can perhaps call a social contract in that has been, or perhaps a social dialogue. Um, and, and when I say social contract, I don't have a very specific definition in mind, but in, in the Netherlands we think of a social contract as, as the way in which the welfare state was reformed towards an activating welfare state. We even have a, a name for, uh, for that. Um, many of the employment policies uh, seem to be introduced in, in, in a way that seemed to be such, you know, against any idea of, of, of effectiveness and, and, and productivity. Uh, when Harun presented the minimum wage policies in agriculture, in particular in South Africa, you seem to have the same sense of, of like, like, how do these policies, you know, ever come into, uh, in, into being with such, you know, immediate negative, negative you know, counterproductive effect in a way. So can you perhaps elaborate a little bit about the political context and say the social dialogue through which those uh, employment policies are introduced? So thank you for a very interesting presentation. I have a mic. <laughs> Thanks, Ingrid, for an interesting presentation. You were uh, explaining the difference between wages and, and productivity, and you explained uh, the discussion yes. about lowering the wages. Could you also, uh, you know, explain a little bit about how the discussion is about increasing productivity? Um, uh, I'm a little curious about the discussions, and I empathize with the points you made on the wage subsidy uh, program. Uh, but I also know that uh, there has been a lot of animated discussions around a pilot on wage subsidy that was done, and I followed some of it. And I wonder if one of the ways that we could convince them of their concerns, right, the displacement, et cetera, would be on the re results from the pilot. And I wonder if you have anything to report on that. Thanks. Uh, thanks. Um, some of them. Problems in South Africa resonate a little bit with the problems in the Middle East, especially the nature of, of uh, youth unemployment being some, a feature that is very present on the highest skilled. So, and, and especially in Tunisia, some of the policies you highlighted have been things that we have been thinking about. So I, I, I wanted to ask you, I, I didn't see uh, at least an emphasis in South Africa, correct me if I'm wrong, on the entrepreneurship agenda, and basically is how especially these public employment agencies can start providing services not only for wage employment, because there may not be wage employment anymore, but how these employment services can work on provision to uh, entrepreneurship awareness, uh, helping young entrepreneurs to do business plans and, and, and maybe target the high, uh, high skilled population. We found that in Tunisia that has helped to make uh, skilled people entrepreneurs. And also, I was wondering if you, if besides the, the wage subsidy, you have thought about maybe uh, some type of training vouchers, especially to take a Louis point of increasing employability and trying to make some maybe some more dynamism uh, in the in the private in the in the private sector, so that uh, high skilled job, youth unemployed go and shop for training that hopefully will get them into jobs. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, great questions, Ingrid. Can you take five minutes to try to address uh, some of them? <laughs> wow, so those, I mean, those were all, all great questions, and some of them I'll, I'll, I'll take as comments rather than questions. So, um, I mean, starting with, with Louise's point about um, soft skills, I mean, I think that's, that's, that's completely right, and I, I mean, I, I, sh I should have mentioned it. So, for example, on, on, on the public works programs, there was, up until recently, a component whereby every, for every month of training, two days had to be spent 
specifically on this kind of soft skills training. Um, that's been dropped, partly because it, when, you know, in the surveys, when you asked people what did they think about the training, a lot of the time they didn't know they'd received it. So either they hadn't, hadn't received it or it had been of such poor quality that they, you know, it, it was as good as, as good as useless. So, I mean, I think that's a pity. I think that probably wasn't the right response to say, well, training doesn't seem to be working. It's, it's just another burden on, on public works programs. Get, let's drop it. Certainly the, the idea of, of internships, I think, um, is, is, is a great idea. Um, I think government is, is going, as always, wants to think quite big. And so they're instead thinking about, for example, year-long community service programs, whereby everybody would then, um, straight after school, be, be, you know, have a, a, a whole one year of doing some kind of, of, of government-sponsored work. That's probably excessive. I think one wants to think about something that, that is much more like what, what, what Louise was describing. Um, Savannah, yeah, I, I completely forgot to talk about apprenticeships. I was meant to talk about it when I spoke about, about training. Um, certainly, the, we, I mean, we actually have a shortage of, of, peop, of artisans. So even though we have this massive unemployment problem, um, there's, there's, there's a real shortage of people with, the, with those types of skills. So what happened was that um, all those colleges essentially were, were, were closed down at some point and the whole apprenticeship system um, just faded away, and, and now we're waking up to the fact that that was a, that was a massive mistake. So there is, there's, there's, there is a pushback towards that sort of vocational training um, with some kind of on-the-job jo on the job training, and absolutely, it's, 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 um, I think that that's one of the few things everybody agrees on in South Africa that, 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 that we need to do. On the unemployment benefits, uh, that's exactly what I meant to say, is that what you, what you want to see there is, is some sort of unemployment benefit but tied to sanctions, tied to, 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 to job search, and, 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 but, and therefore to try to tie in these employment services in a more meaningful way. Uh, I mean, what you don't want is that you, you just force young people to show up at the labor center every day just because that's what they need to do to, to check the box. So I think it, it's going to require much better capacity on the side of, 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 of the labor centers to, to really make that meaningful rather than just a, you know, another, another bit of, 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 of red tape. Um, so you summarized beautifully the, the literature in South Africa on, on, uh, on the, the social grants and, and what they do for labor supply, and then you asked, well, what do we know about young people specifically? So the paper that Kelly's going to present this afternoon, um, funded by Martha at the IDRC over there, specifically looks at um, what happens if we just look at young people. And she's got, she's got really interesting results. Because I, I, yeah, my prior was, was similar to yours. It's like, do we really think that this is going to work um, have the same kind of impacts for young people. So I won't, won't preempt her results, so you can all go to her session. Um, Ariane's question about the role of, of social contract <laughs> and dialogue. I, yeah, tricky. I mean, I think it, 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 we're in quite an adversarial space in terms of, 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 of organized business, organized labor are not being nearly as cooperative as, as, as they need to be if we're going to make any progress on these issues. Um, and I, I, I think everybody recognizes that, that that's a problem. And you, when, you know, when you have one, one um, when, when you have unions saying, we will not talk about productivity, productivity is, is a non-issue, it makes it quite difficult to have, to have that type of conversation. Um, but at the same time, you know, business also needs to come to the party in terms of, of acknowledging that their, um, you know, the, 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 the proportion of, of, uh, total factor product that, that's going to, to capital rather than labor is, has been going up. So, you know, there is, there is something, um, yeah, there's movement from both sides that's needed before one's going to really have any possibility of a social contract. So, for example, a couple of years back we had, there was a, there was a real discussion about wage restraint. Um, could we think about, about businesses actually, given the, the context of the crisis, would businesses think about agreeing to, to, uh, to, to to set a ceiling on salary increases. And there was absolutely no support from that, either from business or from labor. Um, so th when they do agree, it, it, it's also not, help it's not always necessarily helpful either. Um, the question about, about raising productivity. Yeah, um, I guess that's where these, these, these on-the-job training programs come in. Um, that's what the sector education and training authorities are supposed to be doing. Um, a 1%, you know, uh, uh, tax on the wage bill that goes specifically to that should be a massive amount of money to, to provide. There seems to be a, 
Um, firms do seem to be a little bit averse to training because they're convinced that as soon as they train, people will just, will just move on and leave. So one needs to find a way of doing that such that um, businesses buy into, buy into the idea. Um, the question about the pilot of the wage subsidy. So Neil Rankin's presentation this afternoon is exactly about that um, and about the lessons. So I think Neil, Neil's definitely the person to talk to. He ran, he ran the pilot on behalf of government, um, and I think the results are really interesting. Um, entrepreneurship. So I think, that's a, I think your, your comments are spot on. We, we, we desperately need that sort of entrepreneurship training. I think part of the difficulty is you, you really do need um, existing entrepreneurs to, to do some of that skills transfer. It's not clear to me that I can stand up in a classroom and teach entrepreneurship, right, in a, in a way that's particularly meaningful. So I think you do need much, you know, you, you, there's only so much you can do in the classroom. You, need, you really do need that one-on-one -on -one mentorship also to happen. Um, so I think, again, we've, it, it's been the typical thing of a government scheme that seems like a good idea, but then you make it too big. So right now you can only really get any kind of support if you're a reasonably big small business. Um, this, it, it's quite hard to get any kind of support for a true micro enterprise. And I, I don't think we're unique in that, in that situation either. I think it, it does immediately become quite formal. Oh, you need a bank account and let's do this and, you know, and it, it, it quickly strips out the, the, the really micro enterprises. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ingrid. Um, we don't have uh, much time now. I just wanted to say that it's interesting to see yeah, you look at the case of South Africa, and as uh, Diego was saying, other countries facing the same problem, are experimenting with the same types of policies. The training, either for technical skills or behavioral skills, intermediation services, uh, uh, grants for job search, uh, wage subsidies, etc. And it makes sense. It seems that at the end of the day, we need these packages of interventions to address the problem of uh, to improve labor market outcomes for our youth. I, I think the challenge, and we should be thinking about that, uh, all of us, is that this youth population is very heterogeneous at the end. It's not only, it's not only where you are in the age bracket, it's not only your level of education, it's uh, you know, the household conditions, etc. And again, the main challenge will be beyond how to design these programs, how to create portfolios, how to combine these programs for, to target the needs of different, uh, different population groups uh, of youth. Thank you very much again. I think it was a good discussion. And we'll go to coffee break now. Bye.